In this video I'm going to talk about the ROM sets for the Frogger arcade machine and then I'll go over the circuit diagrams and finally I'll go over how to implement the emulator in C. So on this is the actual Frogger game and you see up here the text is quite sort of um, plain uh, whereas if I load up a different ROM set The actual text is 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 like gradiented at the bottom of the text on on each of the on each of the words. And you see down here on the credit, it's got like a, a red line for it because I'm using the the standard color color system. So down the bottom of here, the, the words look a bit funny on this particular ROM set. So if I start off the game, the actual game looks fine, uh, but. The way the ROM set's put together, the colour table um, is kind of different. Whereas if I changed it to a different colour table, now I, what I've done is for this colour table, I've made it so that they grade all of the fonts gradient at the bottom, which makes the fonts look proper. Um, but if I go into the actual game itself, so the fonts here on the screen look okay as well, they just like gradient off at the bottom. But because I do that, the colour system, the colour scheme has to look a bit like this, where the, the the um, actual cars themselves and the logs some, uh, all sort of uh, have the gradiented colours. Uh, so, so some of the ROM sets are like this, where you can have, where you have gradiented text, and if you want to use the proper colour scheme, it, the text looks a bit funny. Uh, but if you make the text look gradiented, the the actual game looks a bit funny. Um, but there is a ROM set where it has the original. Um, color scheme and if I can find the ROM set oh, this is one. and so the fonts themselves aren't grey jinted so they look proper and when you go into the game itself the game looks correct as well so I tend to use this ROM set when I'm actually playing the game and what I'll do is I'll go over some of the, the circuit diagrams uh, and then I'll go over the source code for actually doing the emulation of Frogger. So what I wanted to show with the circuit diagrams is how the Frogger circuit diagram is basically the same as the Galaxian circuit diagram. So at the top I've got the, the Sega Gremlin Frogger circuit diagram. And up here they've got the shift registers for creating the star field. And out at the right hand side you've got like uh, output for noise for helping the audio with noise and then the output of the star field down here and this is the Galaxian's um, circuit diagram which will be Midway um, Namco and uh, the shift registers are the same and out the right hand side is the noise generator for the audio and the star field comes out of uh, the buffers here. So also uh, another part of the circuit diagram so the top frogger again and over here you can see some circuitry which where it has a missile output and you have the set on the Galaxian's circuit diagram you have the same components and you have the missile output here as well so it looks like a, a Galaxian's PCB so finally uh, again at the top is the Frogger PCB and at the bottom is the Galaxian's one and there's a series of 555 timers which are used for generating tones for the audio and you can see that even the transistors over here it's basically the same as a, a Galaxian's PCB but I've tried I've looked at running my this these ROM sets for Frogger on my Galaxian's emulator but the addresses they use they're different and there's a kind of a bit of difference uh, that's going on also the Frogger um, emulation that I've done it, ha it actually supports three different Frogger PCBs so the actual emulation itself is the same but on the actual Frogger PCBs there's different address ranges for different PCBs so I'll go over that in the source code and show how I've done that. So the reason the Galaxian's PCB was probably used in order to create Frogger is that the logs and the turtles and the vehicles they use the scrolling method that the pack of Galaxians uses so the pack of Galaxians is, isn't, um, isn't sprites it's just a set of tiles which are scrolled backwards and forwards by hardware and so that's how they actually make the the lines of logs and uh, turtles and vehicles scroll across the display but they don't use 
missiles or the star fields so it kind of implies that there may well be a Galaxian's ROM set for the Frogger PCB made by Sega. To go over the source code, uh, first of all the configuration file for my emulator. I've got two uh, configurations for this particular emulation. Uh, that's the two different colour modes for the different ROM sets. And the resolution of the display is 224 by 256 pixels. And I've got the two colour sets defined here. And as usual, the colour sets are defined in groups of four colours. Uh, and the colours tend to make up sort of a particular object. So here it's the grass object. And then there's the frog object. And they're kind of arranged like that. So the header fold for my emulator for this particular one for Frogger. Um, there's the difference really is that there's three sets of definitions for the input ports because I'm emulating three different PCBs and I select which PCB I'm emulating at the, the start of the emulation. I define an input for the PCB type one and PCB type two and both of those are on different addresses but the bit patterns on the on that port are the same for both of those particular PCBs. And then down here, I've got the third PCB defined, which is on a different address yet again, but the bit patterns for the actual coin inputs and the left and right player movements, they're all on different bit patterns to the PCBs which are up, up here, which are defined up here. So the C file, for the emulation. At the top I initialize the display to as an area to actually display the emulation onto and initialize the Z80 CPU. Then I mirror the display memory. So there's three areas for the display memory, these three areas here, depending on which PCB you're using. And, but there's two areas where the actual scrolling information is it actually occurs. So two of the PCBs actually share the scrolling information in a particular memory area, and the other PCB has a different memory area. And then I register the callback functions for the Z80. So here I register a clock callback. So every cycle of the actual CPU will get uh, a callback to this particular function. And then the reset callback. So when a reset occurs on the Z80 CPU, it'll call back to here and memory callbacks. So all of the actual I.O. occurs in memory mapped I.O. Even though the Z80 has dedicated I.O. ports, they're not actually being used on this emulation. And then down here I start the actual emulation here. So it hands off the control to the Z80 CPU and then the Z80 CPU starts uh, executing the, the byte codes. And uh, whenever the uh, Z80 uh, CPU actually access, accesses memory, it calls back to the memory function back into this uh, piece of source code and whenever it has a reset it calls back to the reset address in this source code and whenever it has a clock cycle it calls back to the, the clock cycle call back in this source code and once if it's finished emulating it terminates the Z80 closes the display and comes out so this is the first callback. So this is the reset callback, which occurs whenever Z80 is reset. I just keep a note of the memory map as I'm actually going through the actual emulation and building up the emulation. I'll just make notes of where everything is in memory. Now here I actually clear the right protects of all memory. So when I actually load up a ROM set here, it actually makes the areas where the ROMs are loaded read only. Um, so if I'm actually switching the ROM set, a reset of the Z80 occurs and I have to actually clear the write protects here because the ROMs may be in different areas of memory so I want to unprotect all of memory before it reads in the next ROM set and also I, I clear the memory out and the reason I set all the memory back to zero is that because these are similar ROMs, the ROM sets actually doing the same game so I don't want the next ROM set to look at RAM and think that something's already happened because it, it, it's going to look like it's been running before. So I want to make sure everything is clean, reset and, and clear out everything. Then I load up the, the ROM set that's now been requested. And this is where I select what which input I require for which uh, PCB I'm emulating. 
depending on what's what memory is read only so when I load up the ROM set, like I say, the, it makes the memory for where the ROMs are loaded read-only. I can use that uh, particular feature to decide, okay, well, if this particular area of memory is read-only, that means that we're using this, this, this input control set. And in the configuration for the emulation, uh, in, there's like a configuration dialog. I can actually select which color set I'm using, and this is where I decide whether I'm using first or second color set. This is the memory map callback, so this is memory mapped I.O. and uh, it does all its uh, I.O. stuff in here for, uh, for, the, for the actual system itself. Uh, no, normally if you look at my previous emulation videos for arcade machine PCBs, I just have like a single switch statement where it decides which port it's going to actually, it's actually been accessed and then decides what to do on which bits are set in that particular port. But because I'm switching between three different PCB emulations, I've actually got a, a switch statement outside of that, and I decide which PCB I'm, go I'm actually just using the emulation for. And for the, so for the first PCB here, I use these this address and these actions. So if that bit's set on that particular port, then it will set the um, it, sorry if that if, if the coin. Uh, operation on the keyboard on the keyboard on the, on the emulation keyboard is actually pressed it will set this bit to, to tell the emulator that the coin has been set just like down here if a key press for by the user is for player one left it will set this bit on that particular port as well and it, do, it does that for all the different ports so there's like three ports uh, that it has to do it for and then after that particular PCB this is the configuration for the second PCB which is exactly the same it's just that the the memory address here is going to be different or the bit positions might be different and the reason why I'm not just um, combining them all together and, and doing them all as, as one is that you don't want one set of inputs interfering with another one so you can only you have to like select which PCB you're emulating at any particular time when you saw me map, mirror map in the memory for display up, up at the top it happens that none of that memory is actually overlapping on any of the PCBs. So actually I can map the display memory to all three places on the PCB and not have to switch depending on which PCB I'm actually emulating at any particular time uh, because it's not going to interfere with anything. But if I try to just map all of the inputs and all of the bits, they, they, they would interfere with each other. So I have to actually sp specify which PCB I'm emulating and decide what operations occur for the particular PCB I'm emulating at that particular point. And down here, there's the third PCB that I've got inputs for there. So that, that particular, the memory map to IO on this um, emulation is a longer function than it would be in, a previous, in my previous emulations because it's handling all three different PCBs. And this is where I get the clock callback um, from the Z80 CPU. So for every clock cycle, I come into here I decide how to, to time a 50 hertz video signal. So in here, this is the equivalent of a video blanking um, point in time when it gets into here and it sets the next video blanking period as its first task when it comes in. And this is why I needed to clear out memory. So when I load up a new, new ROM set, there's three different addresses which enable non-maskable interrupts. Now if I did a reset and I didn't clear out the memory, then the previous PCB uh, emulation would actually say, oh, non maskable interrupts are enabled and it would start doing non maskable interrupts from the very start and you don't want to do that. So I clear out memory that disables all of these non maskable interrupts and only when the PCB which I'm actually emulating, say it was this one, actually says, okay, non maskable interrupts are enabled, only then will it actually do this. So there's a, there's a few like little gotcha configuration things when you're trying to emulate three different PCBs at once. Um, but it's uh, small enough, the, the actual source file is small enough, it doesn't get too confusing when you're doing it just for this. If I try to emulate lots of different PCBs for different arcades uh, PCBs in this one file, like if I was trying to emulate Space Invaders as well as Frogger as well as Galaxians in one file, then it would get very confusing with all the ifs and the switches. Uh, but just emulating the three Frogger PCBs isn't too confusing. So this is where I read the keyboard on my emulator. So user key presses. I store the user key presses here. 
uh, so that when I'm doing the actual IO memory mapped IO above, I've got all the key presses which um, the user has pressed. And this is where I handle dip switch settings. So you can press a function key on the keyboard and it will come up with a dip switch configuration for this particular arcade PCB. And this is where I handle it in here. Um, I didn't actually show that in the actual demonstration. And this is where I draw the tiles onto the display. So on this particular emulation, so each emulation uh, of an arcade PCB has slight differences and this is one of them. So half the display, the top half of the display is, uh, has a black background of blue. So here I'm just filling the top half of the display with the like blue for the water of the actual uh, Frogger game. And then I come into here and I display the tile sets uh, across each of across the display for all of the X positions and down the display for all of the Y positions. And I've got a little bit of a a hack here. So this is the first time I've done a hack on any of these emulations which you've seen me do so far. So it might be because I'm trying to um, actually emulate three PCBs in one file. Uh, the first couple of lines of the display, I need to force the color to be uh, red and white for the actual score and the score titles. Uh, but the rest of the display, I just use the, what's, what's in memory. And I think that's either because I'm trying to animate three PCBs at once or I'm, I'm using the wrong piece of memory to actually look up these color codes. But this is where it actually displays the actual tiles. And this is the code taken from the Galaxians um, emulation because as I described in the PCB when we looked at the actual circuit diagrams earlier the actual circuit is so similar to Galaxians I can just use the, the, the code which displays the tiles for the Galaxians PCB in the Frogger emulation and this is where I do the display of the sprites for Frogger and this code is the same as the code which you would look, see in the uh, Galaxians emulation as well it's the same so I'm finding that as I go through these emulations, there tends to be a couple of ways of doing the sprites, a couple of ways of doing the tiles. And so when I start a new emulator, I can actually copy some of the code from the previous emulators and get a kickstart on, on how I actually do the next emulation. And then after it's done, displayed the tiles and the sprites, it updates the display and goes around and waits for the next 50, 50 hertz cycle.